Welcome, everybody, back to another episode of Chronicles Magazine podcast. I'm happy to be joined today by a good friend of mine from our libertarian years, Buck Johnson. Um, we've I actually was just on your show a couple of weeks ago, um, but I wanted to do a similar thing over here on this channel. But we're going to be talking a lot about um, religion, um, maybe a little bit of our experience in libertarian circles and sort of what's going on in our minds individually, um, what's kind of driven us away from that world, but also what's going on um, sort of maybe at a more corporate level, like, you know, just just at a bird's eye level. There's a lot of people that are making this transformation. Uh, we're not alone. We're we're all sort of there's a, there's a spirit of return with a V in the air and kind of we all feel it. I wanted to just get into that a little bit. But this is sort of a, um, a pan Christendom uh, conversation. You know, there's a lot of people that listen to Chronicles. Um, that are deeply Roman Catholic. Others have more of a classical Protestantism. There's Anglicans and um, Reformed and Lutherans, and you yourself are um, involved in Eastern Orthodoxy. So we can just talk about things at a general level, and then maybe more, uh, we'll, we'll pick apart your brain a little bit more specifically. But I guess first things first, uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and what you do and and why, why in your perception, I'm interested in talking with you. Well, I am uh, Buck Johnson. I run the Counterflow podcast. I'm an Orthodox Christian. I live in Lockhart, Texas, which is the barbecue capital of Texas. Uh, I'm a lieutenant in the fire department. I don't say which one because uh, I don't want to get those worlds crossed. That kind of gets me in trouble with some of the themes I discuss on my show. But it is a, a large city in Texas where I've done that for over 25 years. And which it's really that's probably given me a, a, a unique perspective on some things. That's the only job I've ever had uh, career wise. And so that's been great, really. And uh, you and I both went through some libertarian uh, uh, times. I will say, I think for you, one of the things I was always drawn to this your content was because outside of a small window of time in my life, I was always more to the right in the libertarian sphere. In fact, prior to becoming libertarian, uh, I was involved like in a, a secessionist movement in the United States. And so, and I knew of Chronicles, geez, for a long time. I'm honored to be on this podcast. Chronicles has been great for me. Um, I love Paul Gottfried and his content, Pat Buchanan and his writing. So this is pretty cool. And uh, both of us have ditched the old libertarian label. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you had Paul on your show? I'm sure you have. I have a few times back when it was death to tyrants prior to being uh, the counterflow. Let's, let's start with that. Why that transition? I mean, maybe, maybe it's reflective of your overall, you know, journey. I, we both, we both hate that word. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, a little bit. I, I had joined in a business venture, I guess you could say a podcast network mm -hmm. when it was called death to tyrants and the guy running, it was like, he wanted me to start a different show. And I was like, dude, I, I can't, this is already, even once a week, when you work in the fire department, you're gone for 24 hours every third day. So just putting out one episode per week was, you know, you, you have to study the books on the, by the guest and do a lot of background work. So that was tying up time. And I said, you know what? I've been thinking about changing the name anyway, because I had had people in the ANCAP world, the anarcho-capitalist world, turn me down because of the name death to tyrants and i i knew that was one of the reasons uh turn me down for coming on so i've been thinking about changing it and that seemed like a good time it was as we were going into oddly enough 2020 and so at the first of the year i believe it was in 2020 my first episode might have been new year's day or something like that within a short short time after new year's uh, I changed it to Counterflow, and when I found that name at the time, I was still atheist, crazy mm -hmm. enough. And but everything from my musical taste to my po politics and philosophy, everything I was into was counter, if you will, to the mainstream, sure. including my job. And someone brought that up, like, "Well, you're running in as everyone runs out of this burning building, so even that is flowing counter." I was like, "See, it's perfect." Yeah. And so that's that's kind of how that happened. And then I, I didn't be, get into Christianity uh, for another year or so after that. Yeah. I mean, how does one, I grew up in broad, like li evangelical circles, you know, um, 
I'm a Californian, lifelong Californian. So it's like the world of, of, of mega churches and all that, kind yes. of, you know, like celebrity Christianity, um, yep. you know, so in my own way, you know, I've made these transformations as well, but what causes an atheist uh, in our time to, to step away from that? This, the spiritual reality, in my opinion, that, that showed it's good and it's ugly over 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. That's when I started because being libertarian, everything's uh, you, you, everything's using reason and ration uh, and rationality. And it's like certain things were displaying themselves over 2020 and it just seemed I couldn't avoid uh, seeing it in a spiritual manner at that point. I, I had a guest on uh, my show. We were talking about some of the events of 2020 and afterwards we were done recording. We were just chatting and he said, dude, if you're viewing this entire what's going on in 2020 as a materialist, you've lost the plot completely. This is all a spiritual warfare battle here. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that's an interesting take. It does. He goes, do you think people care about charts and graphs and figures? You can literally give them state by state and it doesn't matter. This is a spiritual matter to people. No one's using logic and reason and all these things that you've tried to grapple with being libertarian. And it's like, why aren't they listening to me? You know, I've given them the science, the, the <laughs> real science and all this fake masquerading science, uh, which was in a way, in a negative way, spiritual, right? And and it was kind of winning the day. Yeah. And so I started thinking, this is further, this goes beyond politicians and experts making poor decisions and goof being goofballs. Like there's a spirit of evil behind this. And it was also animating a lot of just normal people around me um, that would just be taken over by this evil uh, aura and spirit. It's like, stay at home. Damn you. Take the damn shot. Like I, I just thought what in the world is happening to people right now? This is so, this is not normal. And so that started making me ask more spiritual questions. Do you think that transformation um, that, I mean, cause there's a lot of us, I mean um, you see it, you see it. I see it that people are just beginning to find the spiritual foundation of our of wars. You know, like there's that, there's that, um, there's the meme of the astronaut, you know, and it's like, it's like a cult wars all the way down. It's like, it always, always has been, you know, and yes. like we forget that underneath all the materialism and all of our like human hubris about America's accomplishment in the world, there's this underlying tension, um, this good versus evil. And a lot of people are, are realizing that do you think that's related at all to your and my transformation away from libertarian politics it certainly is for mine i suspect having had this discussion with you a couple of weeks ago it seems like yours as well um because libertarianism relies so heavily on the material and i don't even necessarily mean materialism as in like buying things good for the economy right. not, not even an yeah. economic standpoint of libertarianism which i still to some extent um like we discussed austrian economics i find extremely valuable but i mean the material like the material world it has to do with are you going to aggress against someone and it's such a thin legal uh, definition of uh, that's how it should be it's liberty you know a libertarian legal perspective is so thin that you can't use that to fill up um, your heart, your life, the people around you. That's, that's not, that's a, just a strict legal aspect of what a society should be. And so mm -hmm. for a long time, I was looking at that as like the entire thing, like Liberty is the most important thing in the whole world. And you start to, I start to, um, I started to feel like maybe there was something inside that wasn't being filled as it should that, because that's not deep enough and real enough to actually fill uh, the void. Yeah. What do you think about the state of libertarianism like as a movement? I mean, do you think it was sort of predictable where it all went? And now looking back, I do. Yeah. yeah. It, it, when I was in the midst of it, I could see the tension even within libertarianism that I thought was uh, was, was never ending, right? I, You and I, we come from the Rothbard Rockwell wing of libertarianism and that tension, even when they, those guys are putting out their Roth, 
uh, Rothbard Rockwell report, they felt the tension, right? There's, it's like this hippie faction and, and leftist uh, social aspects trying to use uh, the thin legal definition of libertarianism to essentially do whatever they want. And, and some of the good people within that movement, Harry Brown included, I remember reading a Harry Brown book uh, when I was young and, and he was harping on, you can't have liberty without responsibility. It's two sides. It's two, it's, it's the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. Two sides of the same coin. And a lot of people, especially like the reason wing of libertarian or the Cato wing of libertarianism throughout the two thousands, when it was popular to be anti-war, when Bush was in office, that they were also involved in such leftist social social politics that that tension was always eating at me and i didn't like that and i felt like there was this urge amongst mainstream libertarian inc we'll call it i mean in in their defense conservatism inc does the same thing i think paul Gottfried's covered that quite a bit but this let this appeal to the popular culture or or the left-wing view of things. And it's like, this: you can do all of that you want, the whole like, you must denounce racism or else you're a racist. And it's like, you can kiss ass to those types all you want. The second they find out you're against Obamacare, they'll put you up against the wall too. So it seemed like a futile movement as far as, the, the it's hard to escape the left leftist social aspect of libertarian circles. It's funny because in the 90s, no, it probably wasn't even in the 90s. Maybe it was in like the 60s or 70s when Russell Kirk was, was calling libertarians a bunch of chirping sectaries. Um, you know, and, and Rothbard was engaged in that, like that conflict between the libertarians and the conservatives. You just begin to see that there's something that's um, underlying the whole spirit of, of the conflict. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that, that Lou Rockwell, who's a traditionalist Catholic, right? So yes. I mean, that, that's core to his identity too. If you read the Lou Rockwell Dot com every day you'll notice you know all the time they're posting traditionalist catholic content so i mean that that aspect of political um you know commentary has been there since the beginning and the the reason cato type you know like the regime libertarians basically yes. um they just could not care less about the health the spiritual health of the of the western people and so um, you know, you you want you you begin to see that there's this dynamic there that they don't really belong together, and the whole idea that we can create a movement based on commonality of propositional, um, you know, assent, yes, uh, is the very thing that tore Marxism apart. You know, yep. in, in the first thing that you cannot build a society on propositional agreement. Right. Yeah, because it 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 takes true Christianity or spirituality, if you want to use a looser term and tosses it to the side. And you mentioned when you're on my show, this was the perfect example. It's this free state project, right? So everyone moved to New Hampshire because you are a libertarian, that's it. Mm -hmm. And I was speaking to Jeff Deist, uh, from the, former president of the Mises Institute once offline. And he, this was during the 2020 fiasco. And he said, you have to really stop and think at this point, would you rather live around libertarian atheists in a small society or Christian conservatives right now? <laughs> and it was like, wow, yeah, Christian conservatives. I mean, there's no question. Mm -hmm. And so that also sent me down. Um, it, I just spoke with him offline again about that. And it, he, he didn't even remember having that conversation with me. But I was like, man, that kind of started me at least to open my mind uh, to Christianity. Yeah. Uh, so. Um... You know, just but moving forward, the solution is not to join Conservative Incorporated either. Correct. Because, no. you know, like a lot of our frustrations with the political apparatus um, are even worse in the world of conservatism too. So it's not like you've gone this this journey from Mises Institute to National Review, <laughs> right? No, right, right. Yeah, but, uh, like Paul Gottfried uh, has written and and spoke endlessly about what I think because conservatism is bigger. Conservatism Inc is obviously much bigger than libertarianism Inc. So you you've got some of the similar problems just manifesting themselves differently, but in larger factions. Like there's no question. And I, I the Trump era, the Trump phenomenon was so necessary because it really people the masks were off, and you started. I started to see like wait a second this some of the political landscapes a little bit different than i thought and the friend enemy distinction became 
more clear and obvious. And I think, honestly, I think Trump is just kind of the the goofy guy that got thrown in the middle of this. I don't think a lot of this was with intent on his end, but the reaction to him uh, was just uh, eye-opening, I thought. Yeah. It was really disruptive too. I mean, a lot of people were kind of shaken from their political complacency with Donald Trump, you know, and you, you had to choose a, you had to choose a side in a lane and the line in the sand. And, it, and we began to realize that the line wasn't like non-aggression and aggression, right? Correct. It's, it's much deeper than that. Um, so like, I mean, people like Tom Woods, uh, you know, they've been long involved in traditional, you know, religion. And there's just that certain aspect of things that I think is much more re rewarding, but it's also more foundational to a healthy society. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today, too, was um, like the future of the right wing. I mean, there's a lot of rightists and I talk, we've talked with P Paul Gottfried about this too. And he thinks the whole like, you know, return to paganism movement is just kind of goofy because it's not, it's not connected to who we are. So maybe talk a little bit about like the health of the right wing and, and whether you see like what kind of weaknesses and strengths are there and whether Christianity is going to play a role in bolstering the true right in, in the West. I hope it does. My, my biggest concern, and I think this has reared its head very recently and very abruptly and it's apparent is the i, I don't want to get you in trouble um can we say the z word uh <laughs> yes okay is is the zionist faction within the quote unquote right and i sometimes i'm almost autistic over this because i want to get down and go well it's not really on the right in my opinion but for, right. for you know um that that's how it's going to be categorized but i think if we can be very defensive against that faction and expose that for what it is. I, I think that's healthy on the right. And I think I'm seeing that happen uh, more than I suspected I would. Even voices like, like Candace Owens, who I didn't ever, to be quite honest, pay any attention to mm -hmm. um, before the last month. And she's been quite impressive on this. I think there's good voices like Tucker Carlson, uh, who's, phenomenal on many subjects and we don't have to go down the line i might be able to find well i disagree with them on but broadly speaking for the health of the right wing i think he's incredible incredibly helpful and some of the old almost like boomer con voices that are such pro-zionist i mean you talked about mega churches i i grew up from my teenage years going to Pastor John Hagee's church in San Antonio. And I don't know that there's a bigger right. Zionist mouthpiece than he. And he was, you know, he was promoting John McCain uh, back in 2008, if that was. And so I think that wing of, if you want to call it conservatism, Inc., needs to be flushed away. And if, if that can happen, I think the future of the right is healthy. I certainly think the current regime is extremely weak. And there's going to have to be, uh, you can't just overturn a regime and completely have new grassroots growing up and all the old's gone. You're, you have to have someone within the regime say, wait a second, something's going on and I don't like it here. I think voices like Elon Musk, uh, what they call the PayPal mafia, um, mm -hmm. Peter Thiel, and people like that, while I might not align with them very on very much at all. The fact that they are somewhat working within the regime to what appears to be crack through and overthrow some of it, some of it, I think is a positive thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, in regards to like the religious aspect of, of the right, um, I wanted to, I wanted to get your take, like what, what draws someone to something like Eastern Orthodoxy in the first place? Is it just that, is it, is it a reaction to materialism? Do you think that's a large part of it? That's part of it for me personally. And I do think this is not just me after having a lot of conversations with young Orthodox, specifically male converts, is that the nature within me to want the purest form of whatever I'm into mm. uh, is, is so Orthodoxy was that for me. I did the same thing with music. Like when I was a libertarian, I wanted, I didn't want, let's say, Gary Johnson or Reason Libertarianism. I wanted Rothbard, Hoppe, and these guys that took it down to its purest, most hardcore, if you will, form. And so I wanted to open my mind to Christianity at, uh, once again. And so I, th 
I started looking into orthodoxy because I had a few friends that were, they kept saying orthodox or, and I said, well, you guys have a very interesting and unique take on everything that's going on. What is orthodoxy? And so I started educating myself on that. And it's like, well, it's the first church. And then, and they gave me the kind of a, a quick low down dirty history on, on the splits within the church over the decades or centuries, if you will. And it was like, Oh, well, I like that first one. What, what's, I want to learn more about that. Like, why would I want to go post reform? Like, let's go back to the book of acts and whatnot. And so I got into it because of that. And then once I went to a liturgy, a few liturgies met my priest, you know, I, I felt awkward for one. I stand out. I'm a bigger guy and I'm covered with tattoos. And I, I thought, Oh man, I'm going to this holy, uh, place and they're going to think I look weird. I don't want to talk about politics because my politics are fringe and none of that was important. And even shooting the crap with him afterwards, my priest said, well, you know, no one dislikes the uh, communists more than the Orthodox. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I've, okay, I guess we can talk about politics. I feel safe with that intro. And he discussed how the communists and Bolsheviks, how they basically martyred um, you t more more Orthodox Christians than you could ever imagine. Imagine, and that's what made so many of the saints. And so, learning this was just. I kept thinking, why didn't anyone tell me this before? Why didn't Pastor Hagee talk about these things? Why was it all Israel? Mm -hmm. And then I learned what the true Israel has nothing to do with the state of Israel. It's the body of Christ. And my my mind is still to this day. It's not like I learned Orthodoxy and I'm done. To this day, it's like an endless gulf of, of, of knowledge and spiritual development to, to dig into. A priest told me, when I was Protestant, I felt like I was swimming in, in the shallow end of the pool. And when I became Orthodox, it felt like they had a helicopter, uh, Pinochet style, and dropped me into an ocean <laughs> and, and said, swim. And it's like, it just doesn't stop. Yeah. I find that yeah. You mentioned the the communist war on the the Christian faith, and mm -hmm. you think a lot of this too. Um, maybe comment on the regime's war on religion. I mean, they they dress everything up in Christian language, right? So, yes. so like um, their own their own like LGBT endeavors yes. and stuffing it down our throat is always couched in Christianity. But there's an element of not not an element. It's like it's, it seems to me there's a main part of what they are doing that is war on the Christian religion, war on Christian history. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Like, what is it about Christianity that regimes just cannot um, deal with? Why do they have to, wh why does it come out of them that they despise the Christian faith? Because it's truth and and leftism is, is, is the opposite of the inverse. Everything satanic is the inverse of, of Christianity. So God, Christ is truth. You know, it says, it says that in the, in the Bible specifically. And so egalitarianism, if we're, I'm going to jump around here a lot, but I, I, I think the spiritual warfare manifests itself through political means. So I'm, that's what I'm right. getting at here. And egalitarianism is fake and a lie. It, it cannot, it's literally impossible. And the fact that it's based and in, in rooted in complete lies shows to me that it's the inversion of Christ and truth and, and Christianity is hierarchical. So if you look at the right being rooted and believing in hierarchy as its foundation, which I do, and the left being egalitarianism and its foundation, anything leftist has to dis try to, you can't, you have to try to dismantle truth. And so they're couching their war on us with our terms. And I think the left itself, especially nowadays, because this is the, as I know them, but they're puritanical in nature. Mm -hmm. And the pinch of incense that that the uh, pagans used to want Christians to give, it's the, the left does it right now. As you said, their secular religion is this LGBT alphabet soup thing. And it's like, just put the flag up. Just put the thing on your profile picture. Just the pinch of incense. That's all they want, because then they know they have you. And the hook, the de the demonic hook that's sunk deep inside them, they just want to get it inside you just a little bit. And so anyone that fights that, fights the pinch of incense, it's historical. This stuff's not new, right? It rhymes. Um, 
that's that's what then your your enemy public enemy number one if you've got a big enough platform or profile that's when they really try to hammer you down um but we saw that even throughout 2020 i had so many strikes on youtube for having people say things that are factually correct mm -hmm. but it went against the lies that the regime was founding their entire narrative on so i you got to be off you can't be on here strike strike kicked off that kind of thing it's it's amazing to watch it happen in real time but it's even wilder to look back and go my goodness i didn't say anything incorrect yeah yet. exactly but but their the regime mm -hmm. the leftist regime is built on lies and so they hate christianity because it's rooted in truth in christ right exactly um one of the things that you become aware of when you study like his, the historic faith, um, whether that's Catholicism, Lutheranism, Anglicanism, um, you know, Orthodox, is you begin to realize the importance of, of like um, icons and symbols and yes. signs. Um, and you see that just because society has been secularized doesn't actually mean that it's been secularized in the way that they want you to think it has. The symbols are there. The signs are there. Um, mm -hmm. You still have, you know, blasphemy laws. You still have creeds and confessions and formulas and rights, right? So, like, maybe talk about that. I mean, maybe, like, let's talk about secularity. Like, maybe that's all a lie and that these things are religious in nature. A hundred percent. Do you have any experience yeah. in thinking about that whole side of things? I do. I just recorded an episode based on on puritanical uh secular religion because and the priest that i was with interviewing that i i've been thinking the same thing i keep i keep telling people i was an atheist but at the same time there's no such thing as an atheist mm -hmm. you can say i don't believe in the christian god but you are going to fill uh worship is just attention you are going to fill the void or attempt to fill the void within with something you are going to give a majority of of your attention to something that's your god and if you're a christian it should be god and oftentimes we all fall and fail at this maybe it's we're looking at our phones too much or we're doing this or that or concentrating on fox versus cnn but whatever the case is you are going to feel something and there's there is no such thing as actual atheism in the, in the respects that we all have our gods it's just you might not be aware you might not call yours that but certainly if you're in the alphabet soup movement that's i mean that's they're more devout than many christians are to their cause much more right, right. and and so i and i think we're seeing it with with the zion zionism thing too i mean it like look at what ben shapiro did everything's cool we're on the right yeah we're all the same category here until you speak against the taboo thing that you can't say and this as soon as you denounce zionism or geez if you say christ is king then all of a sudden we have a problem and so i think it's interesting and it's uh it's the emperor has no clothes moment i think we've been in that for a few years now you're starting to see people's true colors and what they actually represent and if you don't understand that as spiritual I, I would suggest maybe start looking at that as a spiritual uh war because that's what it is and and just because ben shapiro um is against high tax rates and so are you and he's against affirmative action unless it's for zionists and so are you i, I would look at those things as very very surface level and and try to get deeper deeper below the surface because again this it's they might call it secular but it's secular religion and the second you you go against the alphabet soup thing and you don't put the flag up then you're marked for for martyrdom essentially have you read paul gottfried's um multiculturalism and the politics of guilt that was my first book of his that i read yeah yes. mine too i mean that's one of the prevailing themes of his entire like um understanding of the framing of American society in the 20th century was the secularization of puritanical roots, right? Yep. So like in the progressive era, um, you see the state and it's, you know, secularizing tendencies is basically taking over uh, Christianity first, but, yep. then, but then applying these secular puritanical themes on American society. And then it becomes this, 
you know, you all the things that they claimed about that were bad about like the, you know, the pre-enlightened um, world, the pre-enlightened mm -hmm. Western Christendom has suddenly become, um, you know, their tool. I mean, they're the ones that are now extremely oppressive. And if you dissent from the cathedral, I mean, this, this comes from, you know, people like, um, mold bug, right? I forgot, I forgot, yeah. Curtis Garvin. But like, you know, there is a cathedral there. There is a religious, you know, you do have a priest cast and you do have all these aspects because that's what it means to be human. We're inherently yes. religious creatures. Correct. Um, and so it just strikes me as obvious, becoming increasingly obvious that there is no true right wing without the religious components to it, because to be on the right, right is to believe in history and to believe in, um, you know, a, a realist perspective of anthropology. And if you deny religion, you can't actually, you know, have those things. And hierarchy, hierarchy, we get hierarchy from Christ. The, the church, the Christianity is rooted in hierarchical language. The entire worldview, etymology, whatever you want to call it, is, is hierarchical, which is on the right. And then to, to your point about the, the, their symbols and their icons, think about just the pressure during the summer of love with George Floyd. You better put that black square on your social media thing. You better put that black square. Oh, he didn't put a black square. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's just, again, the pinch of incense. Pride Month's coming up here in June. You better, if you've got a business, you better put a rainbow. And think of how many people were putting those signs in their yard, BLM, or we believe in science, just to avoid their house getting ransacked during mm -hmm. the summer of 2020. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what that was. And, you know, if you, I can get into deeper theological associations too. Fauci was the high priest. The jab was the, was uh, communion. Mm -hmm. um, the mask was the rosary. There's so many symbolism elements to what, what happened. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the mask thing itself, I mean, you knew, you knew who was um, saved and who was unsaved. I mean, you, right. you can just tell there's these outward signs, these outward seals of, um, you know, your involvement in the church. I mean, that's, yeah. that's it can all be, seen in religious uh i think that's unavoidable when you deal with human society yep and and there may still be people now wearing the masks that actually think oh i'm being safe but i i wholly believe a majority of people that had them on that weren't just doing it because they were told to in a store the ones that voluntarily did it were doing it to 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 signal this is a signal this is symbolizing something that i'm on this side of good Right, exactly. They, they weren't actually thinking, well, I'm, I won't get sick if I do this. There's enough proof that we knew that was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I, there was religious symbolism through all of that. Yeah. How much do you think this um, this desire to return to something more ancient um, is sort of a reaction to the sort of the mindless presentism that affects I, it? Like there's no, there's no history. I mean, history started – you know, in Nuremberg or in the civil yeah. rights movement, like that's, yeah. that's where history started. Everything before that was evil. But you think a lot of us are like, this actually is not fulfilling at all for yes. our humanity. Talk about yeah. the religious aspect of that. Maybe. I, geez, I, you're giving it, uh, <laughs> you're giving it too much credit. I, I think a lot of people think history started in, when Barack Obama got elected or something. Yeah. Uh, but there's, it's empty for one. We're inundated with, with media and, and with things all around the black mirrors on our phones. But so that's part of it. It's just, we're not meant to intake this much information so quickly, immediately, and to fire out our opinion to thousands of people. We're not made to do that, quite frankly. And think of like, I think of Christian Orthodox saints and even modern day ones like Father Seraphim Rose and these guys that were living in our times, like in the Bay Area in the 60s, he witnessed the hippie culture, this the Eastern uh, mysticism culture. And even he started feeling like there's too much going on that's not real. This is empty, it's it's hollow, it's shallow. And I think humans have a natural want to to feel something that's actual actually real. I mean, I think plenty of people will say, you know, you're looking at your phone and it's like, I got it. I got to go outside. Even the stupid saying, go touch grass like that, that is, is somehow rooted in a, the, the real fact and truth that we are longing to actually be tied to something that's real and physical and not just this empty, like, Oh, Hey, yeah, Trump did this. Biden said this. It's like return to your roots is something that I think 
I mean, I think black culture has that an element of it that's that's that they're feeling right. They want to find out black history and 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 their black leaders and whatnot. But that's that's fine. But then it feels like even some modern day conservatives. I, I one of the times I was disappointed in Tucker was when he's talking to Vladimir Putin, and Putin goes into this history lesson um, about why everything led up to to Russia and Ukraine, and Tucker goes, "Oh, I didn't need a history lesson." It's like. Well, yeah, you, you you do, because you ha this war didn't start two years ago or three. Like you're talking about a culture, two cultures that have been because of the U.S. and NATO largely, but have been split for at least the last ten years since 2014, when this when these things went down with Victoria Newland and all that was going on there. You at least need to know that part. Mm -hmm. And so. I think even him saying, well, I didn't need a history lesson. It's like, if that's a common sentiment with people, uh, I would push back and say that you, you might need one. <laughs> yeah. You might. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause like, you know, I, I have um, people I know just in my area and um, they just have no interest in history at all. Like where they came from, you know? And, but I think that that's sort of a, almost a dying uh, mentality. I think a lot of people do actually want to know the roots because I think one of the things that comes out of, that as we come away from like secularity and liberalism and all of its claims and promises is we realize that there's more to who we are than just our present individual moment. You know, yes. like we, we actually belong to something that preceded our own life and we belong to something that will come after our own life. And I think that sort of mentality is inherently contradictory to the claims of the post-war American, you know, mentality, this idea that we are, so, there is something broader here. There's not just me, my own moment, my own pleasures. Mm -hmm. I think it's generational to an extent and not to throw an entire generation on the bus, but the baby boomer generation seemed to be the first one mm -hmm. to kind of disassociate themselves in lifestyle, uh, let's say family uh, patterns and whatnot from the previous generations. They started having less kids the wives, that was where the wives started going to college more so. Um, you know, my mom didn't finish, but she almost got her degree. Her mom didn't even go, right? So as as these generations moved on, it, the boomers were the first one to kind of disassociate with maybe what was a um, historically rooted tradition and family uh, respect and whatnot. In fact, when I started, I, I was the first in my family to start looking down at the, through a family tree before 23 and me and these things were out like that. I actually was going to the library and trying to figure out like past relatives and go through the war on Northern aggression history and who was on which side. And my boomer parents were like, well, that's neat. We never thought about doing that. <laughs> like you didn't. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. There's just no curiosity uh, in that generation. Um, and and you can just see, and it's kind of reflected in like the spirit of this uh, this market economy. And it's I, I wouldn't call it a free market economy, but you can you can totally there's just like obsession with change, yeah. you know. And and I know that's sort of like you know a lot of people think that's a ridiculous type of critique, but I think a lot of like traditionalists are beginning to realize that there's something to it. There's something um, uncohesive, if that's even a word. That there's something that's tearing apart society that comes from our obsession with tomorrow's innovation. And I wonder if like if it's even sustainable to think about all the things that you know Elon Musk is doing and all the innovation stuff. But there's actually a, a counter tendency among younger people that are not interested in that because they want to rediscover. So there's this tension between like what Elon Musk is doing, but also this spirit of return, you know, return with a V. There's like this this um, this tension there. Do you have any comment on that? Do, I mean, do you think the people of that are pursuing virtual reality and things like that are going to be successful? Or do you think there's going to be a wholesale rejection of it? I think there's going to be a wholesale rejection of aspects of it because VR, uh, virtual reality and um, artificial AI, artificial intelligence, that's so broad. Uh, those terms are so broad that you could mean anything from a fake sex, sex bot girlfriend to just an, an app that can help you type a paper or give your podcast a cool image. So the ones that were the the forces trying to make some sort of sentient beings with AI, I think, I hope <laughs> that there, there could be some sort of um, mass rejection of that sort of thing. I do think the things that, and I'm coming into this kicking and screaming, I've never used AI 
anything that, oh, I actually have for video shorts for my podcast. But those type of things, I could see people going, well, it does make things easier, kind of like an app on a cell phone versus a smartphone versus having a flip phone. However, to your point, though, imagine being a, of the Zoomer generation now and coming up. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this coming up where they're feeding you the same things that I was fed, that you were fed, like, oh, if you go to school and you form a family and you you can buy a house. And it's like, are you kidding me? No, you can't. Right. So I think being a, of the Zoomer generation, you have an easier time not falling for the BS that certainly millennials have fallen for. And I, to an extent, for whatever reason, Generation X still was pushing back. I don't know why we did that because we were left to our own devices. I suppose my parents were always at work and we just did whatever. But this helicopter parent um, raised generation, and that, there's this is all fake. And so I think it's easier for them to go, I'm not listening to this crap. And and to blow off all of some, some of the modernity and and because it's all garbage. And I think it's easier for a younger generation now that you come up in your let's say 22 and you look at the landscape of everything that's going on how on earth would you believe that all this modernity has, has been a good thing when you look around and everything's fake and yeah. so i think within that generation we're going to see some some wise young men and women coming up and I, we've already seen that i i'm i know you were on the jay burden show and but people like that especially in the right boy it's refreshing when i hear their voices yeah, for sure. Um, I have uh, four younger brothers, you know, and it's it's interesting because I I was like the, I mean I have I have one younger brother who's closer to my age, but we kind of preceded the internet in a way. Like we still have like residues of memory before it all existed, you know. They're the last they, generation. Yeah, they don't. I mean, they literally do, do not know. Um, they can't conceive of a world where they don't have these things, um, and yet at the same time, they wonder. They wonder what it was like before. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that actually like boomers always say, all oh, young people are addicted to their technology or whatever, but they wonder about the past in a way that those older generations actually don't wonder. They're just, mm -hmm. they're stuck in front of the TV. And as things like Fox news and CNN and MSNBC are less mm -hmm. and less part of um, the making of our, of our minds, yep. um, you know, people begin to, to can, they can distinguish between the world before and, you know, the, the, the world of like um, TV propaganda, you know, yes. that, that helps the momentum as well. That is huge. And and I love my parents, by the way, but I do see a tendency if if Fox News says it, it's true. And I think that's that boomer generation. And I'll obviously on the left, the, the, there's boomers that say the same thing about MSNBC. I get it. But there's that tendency to inherently trust what the quote unquote experts that you like are telling you. And I think the younger generation, your younger brothers and the Zoomers, that's not inherently there be, mm -hmm. because they all look at no, they don't they don't have cable for one, usually. And they would see a, a Sean Hannity and not no one would take that seriously, I hope. And, <laughs> and same with Rachel Maddow. And like these people look they, they look the further you get away from their claws and, the, and being in that grasp, the sillier it looks. Yeah. So let's bring this back around now. Um, you know, as, as like this, you know, to, to use a story from Paul, you know, as the scales fall from our eyes, you know, as a society, and we realize that the experts and professionals and the people that have been, you know, well credentialed are actually not leading us in good directions. Uh, we have to seek our wisdom elsewhere. And I think that's where the religious aspect comes in as well, because these are timeless, um, nuggets and treatises and um you know just just lakes like you mentioned the ocean oceans of just wisdom that um supersede um hundreds of years of human hubris um and i think that we're longing for it as humans we're longing for something that's sort of timeless um this is what russell kirk and t.s Eliot referred to as the permanent things so there's this aspect of conservatism where we can connect with the past but at the same time, it's not 20th century conservatism. It's actually much more reactionary. And perhaps our posture has to be more reactionary. So maybe just in the last couple of minutes, we can just talk about, you know, what it means to be a reactionary today. Um, you know, what are some of the the, the, um, the possible pitfalls of being a reactionary? But why do we need to have that perspective more than just a lackadaisical conservative one? That's a great point. Um, and I, I agree with, with, with the sentiment of it. You have to, well... 
I think it's healthy to be a reactionary in that we're still surrounded by regime propaganda, if you will, on both sides. Right. Uh, I think the Zionist stuff you need to be careful with on the right and on the left, <laughs> all of it. And so to react against that, I understand the danger in, in, in painting yourself as a revolutionary reactionary is that sometimes you're putting what your quote unquote enemy in the driver's seat and you're allowing you're just reacting to what they do rather than like making something organic of, of that's your own or creating your own worldview, your space, whatever you want to call it, your family. But to just say to sit and watch TV and react and get mad and oh the LGBT, you know, and to focus all your energy on that becomes negative. And so I think the the pitfall to watch for is 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 that one to mm -hmm. understand what you're reacting against the evil um what's essentially what i would call a, the, the a satanic presence and spirit in the world that's okay to react against you you were called to do that but i wouldn't focus all of your time on that focus on what's beautiful truthful positive at the same time and then i i will also say i think uh, my friend jason from the two-bit podcast has t deemed this we're exiting the spirit of the uh, devouring mother which we certainly saw throughout the 60s and, and i think ended at some point in 2020 you know, i mean that was the devouring mother spirit and we're heading into the vengeful son the the most dangerous part of the vengeful son spirit is that it will feel good to people on the right um i don't want to see uh, a trans person hanging from a lamppost do you, but do you think that do you think elon musk represents that ethos at all yes when he sat in front of that um, big room full of people and someone asked him about, well, how can you, don't you want to, uh, don't, you don't want to offend the head of Disney or whatever. And Elon gave two birds. That's vengeful son. Mm. Um, that, that game stonk thing that happened a couple of years ago where they're like, we're going to short, short all these, these rich people on wall street with these um, gamer stocks or whatever. And they, they asked the guy that was the head of it. It's like, well, you're going to go broke too doing this. And he goes, I don't care. I just want them to pay because they hurt my father, mm -hmm. the Wall Street people. That's the vengeful son. Uh, I, I would just say be careful of going too far and that feeling good because it's to some extent you're using – that's the same energy that's enveloping the bad people on the left, and you're just inverting it into your own will. And I, I would – warned to be careful of that i think there's a, a book there's a book called um the politics of despair i think it's by fritz stern i think that's his name but he really he really draws this out that um and i think i think trump kind of represents some of the early stages of this where look we're just ticked off like yes. you know, trump is just a proxy like if you say trump's a bad guy well then that's exactly my reason for voting for him because i hate yes. you you know, yep. you've destroyed my life. You destroyed my heritage. You destroyed every aspect of what was good in my own childhood memory. Uh, of course, I want you dead. I don't care about the consequences. Right. Um, that's not something that builds. That's something no. that destroys. And maybe we do have to undermine the regime, but we also have to think about building. Yeah, we need like a we. I, I do think Trump was very necessary. We needed him to come in like the bull in China shop and kind of shatter and wreck things. But we need like a Pat Buchanan to come in here and order things nicely now <laughs> something yeah. like that yeah well i mean i think with pat buchanan that's a great way to end the show because i do think he's the uh he's the man that we didn't deserve <laughs> sort of in yeah. the 90s but um he he represents i mean l l l i'll let you finish with this too but um uh because you asked me if like a, a like a bunch of trivia questions about my favorite people but let me let me let me let me get that right back at you like what do you think of people like ron paul and pat buchanan and, and people like that still wonderful i have nothing but but good things I, i've met ron paul m right. many times in person i've been to his house there's no one i've ever met that's more kind genuine and just loving uh than as far in that realm of of society uh wow. than he is he's he's the real deal he's an amazing mm -hmm. human being um it makes, never it makes you sort of glad that he didn't become president because they would have destroyed him. And, and oh. while Trump can take it, um, you yeah. just don't want to see that happen to the Paul family. <laughs> so. No, he. Um, I remember a couple of years ago. I don't even like bringing this up, but he had a medical incident, if you will. On, uh, I didn't. I wouldn't watch it. I didn't want to see it. Oh, just look at it. I don't know. 
I don't, that's the last thing I want to see is something bad happen to him. Yeah. Um, and Pat Buchanan, I've never met, but I certainly love his writings and it's neat to go. You could still, obviously you guys know, go on YouTube and online and find some old clips of him on crossfire and, and some yeah. of these shows like that. And he's just, wow. What were we thinking? You know, yeah. like, why was he not president? What the heck? But, but, but the right was enveloped in this neoconservative, um, neoliberal, if you will, interventionist foreign policy kind of mindset that just warped and ruined that movement. Yeah, for sure. So I guess in summary here, um, you know, the right needs um, our religious past to be sustainable. And I think um, religion can't ignore politics forever. Um, there's something that about, um, you know, the, the human, about humanity that requires it to um, you know, look to the heavens in order to guide its way on earth. And I think that's just, uh, it's, it's something that's been denied over the 20th century and it's something that can be denied um, no longer. So uh, Buck, I appreciate your time on this. And I guess um, the last question is where can people find you? Counterflow podcast is the show. It's anywhere that you listen to a podcast. If you type in counterflow, you can find it, go on YouTube, Odyssey, um, Rumble, all of that. I'm there and you can follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. Uh, I came up with Puck Rebel as my email back when I was still into the secessionist Southern stuff. So it still sticks. Yeah, well, cool. Thanks for joining me. It was a great conversation. Thanks, CJ. Mm -hmm.